Hello, everybody sleeping or are you awake? Morning, awesome. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, my name is Andy. I am a CNCF ambassador. I also work at Dynatrace, but I'm really happy to actually have with me today Nicolas, who is a first time speaker, which I think uh, a, a round of applause, please. It, it, is, it is not easy to stay on stage and look at these people. But Nicolas, maybe a quick introduction, who you are and especially what does Clario do? Yeah, yeah. Hello everyone, also from my side. So I'm pretty happy to be here today. Like Andy said, it's the very first time for me standing here on stage at the KubeCon. And yeah, um, I'm working for Clario. I guess most of you already know the company where Andy is working for Dynatrace. But um, Clario is, is doing a bit different. So we're working um, on software and hardware for clinical trials. That means, um, yeah, if you think about a drug which is supposed to be released on the public market so that patients get access to that, we first need an FDA approval. And in order to get that FDA approval, that's where Clario comes into play with developing modern software or medical devices um, yeah, in order to do those clinical trials. Um, we are one of the market leaders in that area and we have around three to 4,000 employees. So yeah, that's about Clario. Yeah, you, you make sure that the world is a healthier place where the people yeah. are healthier. Yeah. Uh, talking about health, who of you has any type of fitness tracker? Yeah, how many, who has more than 10,000 steps already today? Show of hands, because these are the ones that went running in the morning, I guess, or you got lost in the uh, convention center. But, uh, the reason why I'm mentioning it, uh, we will have a couple of references to health tracking, which makes sense with Clario being in that, in that business. Uh, one of the things that I'm passionate about is uh, in my role as a CNCF ambassador, we try to bring new people in the community forward on stage to show what they're doing and what they've done. Um, and so one of the things that I want to highlight here is, I want to start with, why are we actually on stage? The reason why we are on stage, it was in Paris earlier this year, I did a presentation at ArgoCon where I talked about how we can get observability into Argo deployments if they start failing or if they uh, get slow. I was promoting uh, a CNCF project called Captain, as you can see on my head maybe, K-E-P-T-N, that provides automated uh, traces for every deployment that you do on Kubernetes, and Argo is a very common tool in that space, so we bundled it up with an Argo demo. And one of the things uh, that I highlighted there is actually tracing and getting an end-to-end -end trace of what is happening, where time is spent. And then I think we sat down after lunch, and then he said, hey, this is actually a really cool idea. Yeah. You were not using Argo back then, but a different tool. Yeah. And he also said, we are also using more tools, like using GitLab as a CI. Yeah. And then we started discussing, how can we bring this type of visibility we're bringing on the deployment across the whole software development lifecycle? So in the discussion, oops, wrong, wrong button clicked, right? In the discussion we had is, you mentioned a couple of points that I tried to highlight here. Questions that you typically see and have if you're responsible for the heartbeat of your platform, which is your CI CD. Around deployment frequency, uh, around the lead time, so these are some of the DORA metrics. Also a question is where is my code actually deployed? Right? If you are a developer and you have a large environment and you don't know where, where, where things are deployed. So there's a couple of questions here that I assume some of you are also asking yourself uh, every day. Now, what we are going to learn in the next 25 minutes is actually what happened between Paris when we had sat down after lunch and now. And we also, as I said, we always try to align it a little bit with health, with fitness. Um, on the left side you see, I think it's a screenshot from your health tracking yeah, app. Yeah. What, what, do you, what do you use? Uh, Apple Watch. Apple Watch. I have a Fitbit. Um, so it seems uh, 135 beats per minute. I think you were either running or maybe, was this well, before? In the, the in the gym, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously these are good health indicators for human body, but then we can also have health indicators for our pipelines because we want to make sure our pipelines are running smooth. There's no hiccups, there's no problem, they're not high pl blood pressure, or if there are any indicators on where we need to counter to make sure we stay healthy, um, then this is what we can achieve with observability. Challenges that we also discussed because when we, when, we said, when we sat down and defined that content of this talk today, we said, okay, what are other real things that make this uh, a thing we need to tackle? And I think what you said, Chris, um, uh, Nicolas, was the challenge is not that we have one pipeline or two pipelines, we have many different pipelines. So scaling this across pipelines that are not just doing a simple job, but that are also very complex in the tools that you're using. And then getting an end-to-end -end visibility 
um, is something that you want to tackle with observability. So, from March to now, it's November, uh, a lot of things have happened. You have contributed and you've started a prototype on a open telemetry receiver for GitLab, but without stealing the thunder, I want to now pass it over to you to give a little bit more details on what does the situation at Clary really look like, what you've implemented, and how we can then also get this audience together and collaborate a little bit more on what you've built. Yeah, all right, thank you, Andy. And that brings me to the first slide. So before I jump right into the details, how we were able to like track our pipelines and do all of that cool stuff, I thought it might be interesting if we first have a look at how the CI/CD pipelines in general are looking like at Clario. So as Andy mentioned, we are using GitLab for our CI and CD tool and uh, in general for our Git source code management. And um, we usually start with, um, so if you think about the developers checking in on your code change, and the very first thing we are doing is we are building the application, we are compiling the application, and then we run some kind of automated tests, so that could be unit tests or any other test which somebody added. Now, once this is successful, and once yeah, like the application is still working and nothing broke, then we are starting to create a Docker image. And from the time on when the Docker image got created, we are in theory in a deployable state. So from that time on, we could theoretically deploy to production. But of course, we don't want to deploy immediately to production after we created the Docker image. So we first execute a bunch of pre-release jobs. And that would be deploying to lower testing environments where the QA team can test different um, scenarios. We run different kinds of security scans. So you can think about SAS scans or uh, dependency scanning, license scanning, um, also dynamic application scanning, all those um, security related scans. Um, in addition to that, also things like code analysis, so unit test coverage, for example, and other things. And once all of that is completed, then we um, hopefully get the green light from QA and everything's looking good. And then we come to the phase where we actually go towards production. And then we usually start first with release preparation jobs. And in there you can think about it like um, creating release notes, release documentation, creating a Git repo tag. And also one thing we do is we run validation steps in our pipeline. So we use Kiverno for that, that we run, um, for example, validations against our hand charts. That means um, if there is a service which wants to deploy to production but doesn't have any probes configured, for example, that's a no-go for us. So we expect that probes are in place. And in that case, we would then either allow or restrict the deployment. Then day X, the deployment to production, hopefully everything works fine. And after that, um, we execute a bunch of more tests and validation stuff simply to ensure that everything is working fine. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of different jobs involved there and different technologies. We are building the application, creating the Docker image. We are validating a lot of things. We are deploying something. So when we think about how we can get observability into that, we need something which is like really flexible and doesn't care about which tool is used or which job is executed. And on the other side, we would also like to have some nice monitoring or visualization possibilities. And I mean, that sounds like a perfect use case for open telemetry, and that's exactly what we did. So as Annie mentioned, um, we met at Paris the first time, and there we started with um, adding an OTIL exporter job to our pipeline. And the way it worked there was that we first had to execute all the jobs in our pipeline. And then at the very end, what you can see here, job three, OTIL export, that job was then querying earlier jobs, like how did the jobs work, were they uh, successful or not, how long did they take, and sends them to an OTIL collector via the OTLP protocol. And then again, the OTIL collector exported to the uh, monitoring backend of our choice, in our case, Anatrace. Now, this approach works fine, and um, also I would say the implementation for that is quite easy. So you can see here on the left, it's maybe yeah, 15 lines of code, what we need to, to achieve that, but it comes with a few limitations. And but by the way, you can see two QR codes here. So Andy and myself, we created a video and a bit of documentation about that approach already. So if you're interested in how you could set that up in detail, you can scan those QR codes and get more insights. Um, but the point here is um, it's more like suited for simpler use cases because we have certain limitations. And if we now think about um, failed pipelines, for example, which stop at the deployed F uh, stage, for instance, then we wouldn't even reach the OTIL exporter job. So we wouldn't know if the pipeline failed. So um, we, we can say if we have like pipelines which always run through 
and work fine. We should be good with that. But as soon as, as we have like child pipelines or retry jobs, we will have a problem with that approach. And also one thing to note, we need to configure a GitLab API token, which has read access to our repo. So, yeah. Now, before we come to um, the approach, what we are doing now and how we can improve those limitations, I think it's first interesting to quickly talk about the hotel collector. And I'm not the biggest hotel collector expert, so you should reach out to the maintainers if you have really detailed questions there. But um, I wanted to highlight three things here. And that's like the receiver, the processor and the exporters. And um, you can think about it like the receivers, like the name already says, receives the data. Then we process that data through the OTIL pipeline in the collector, and then we export it to our monitoring backend. And now for us, that means if we would have something like a GitLab receiver, which understands the data which we somehow sent to our uh, collector, we would be able to also export that later onto our monitoring backend without having that additional job in our pipeline. And um, now if we assume that we have that certain GitLab receiver, um, the next question would be how do we get the data? And that's where GitLab webhooks come into play. So th there's the cool option to send a webhook to a certain URL based on every pipeline status change which is happening in our pipelines. That means either if the pipeline got created, failed, was retried, canceled, whatever, GitLab would tell us, hey, something was going on in the pipelines. And with that, we could now change the diagram to something like this. So we can see we don't need that auto exporter job now anymore in our pipeline. And instead, we just do all the hard work in the collector with the GitLab receiver. And we just rely on the webhooks where GitLab is telling us, hey, something changed in your pipelines. And um, that brings a lot of advantages to us because on one side, like I already mentioned, we are now tracking every single pipeline status change. We don't miss out on any information anymore. And it's super easy to set this up. So assuming you have the auto collector with that GitLab receiver in place, all you need to do is you need to go to the settings of the webhook and you need to enable that. And you can do that on project level, but also on group level, which makes it really powerful because you can just go to a group and enable it there. Um, a few things to note on the GitLab receiver or the auto collector. So like Andy said, I was, I was mainly playing around with that and it's not really a, a auto related project, so an official maintained project. Um, we, we started playing around with that. It works pretty good for us. And now we are thinking about what could be the next steps with what we achieved. So um, you can also scan the QR code here. You will reach the GitHub repo where I store the code for this. Um, there is a small readme in there which describes like how you can build your collector with the GitLab receiver. But if you have any questions, you can also reach out to me when you need help to test that. Now, enough of the theory and let's look about how this looks in action, how we can use actually open telemetry as our fitness tracker. Um, I prepared a small demo group here, which simply should simulate a few uh, microservices, which should be in that group here. You can see we have the Berlin service because I'm from Germany. We have the Delhi service. We have the Salt Lake City service. Obviously, we're in Salt Lake City today. And we have the Vienna service from Austria and the Tokyo service. And um, as I said, those services are not doing anything. It's just a simulation of how a potential microservice pipeline could look like. Now, if we want to instrument that, um, as I said, the only thing we need to do is we need to deploy our auto collector to Kubernetes or some instance where we can send a request to. And then we go to the group settings here, to the pipeline observability group. We configure the webhook and boom, we are done. That's it. So from that time on, we are sending every webhook to our collector and then forwarding it to Dynatrace. And the way it looks like then is that we have this nice dashboard, what we can create with the data and the traces we get from the collector and visualize that in a nice view. And um, yeah, pretty much the same, like we can track like our workouts and our activity through, throughout the day. We can now, for example, also see, okay, how often did I deploy to which environment? When did I deploy to which environment? How long does it take for my deployment to reach production? And this is just a small example with what's possible. So there are a lot of more possibilities you could put in a dashboard. And I will have a few more examples um, what you can do with that. But um, what, what I found interesting is that if we look at the Dora DevOps report, so they, they are saying like, okay, the elite DevOps performers are deploying once a day or they could deploy once a day on demand and they need less than one day in order to promote a change to production. 
So if we assume that we have that pipeline instrumentation with Autel in place and we have the dashboard, it would be really easy for us to compare how we are doing with those Dora metrics. So I think that's pretty cool. Now, um, the dashboard is already pretty useful, but we can also work with that dashboard. That means we can, for example, select one project, we can select a few projects we're interested in, or we select all projects. So with that, we can really get a closer look at which projects are doing in which way when it comes to the software delivery lifecycle. And um, another interesting thing is if we think about what else we can track. And there we, for example, could also track our sleep. And when I first saw this, I, I found it pretty funny because I think it looks very similar to Autel traces. So um, same like the different sleep phases we see here in that screenshot, we also see when we have our traces when it comes to yeah, different Autel instrumentations. And um, wouldn't it be awesome if we also would have that for our pipeline? And um, yes, that would be awesome. So we could, for example, know if we're yeah, dealing with pipelines which have like more like sweet streams, so everything is looking great there in green, or in reality, if we are maybe dealing with nightmares. So you can see we have a visualization of our pipeline trace here. And if you look closely, we could see that the exact same pipeline, which was completely green earlier, had something which stands out of it. So the front end build job suddenly takes much, much longer than all the other jobs we have in our pipeline. And um, yeah, we, we wouldn't have noticed that if we just look at the GitLab visualization. Of course, if you'd like check every job manually and check the duration there, then you would notice that. But I still think that's a very nice view to visualize what is going on in your pipelines. Now, we can, of course, argue that um, nobody would check each and every menu, uh, trace manually and all the pipelines we're executing. And I agree with that. So um, we should and we can use alerts. Um, in that example here, you can see I set up a static threshold where I say, okay, all of my build jobs should not take longer than 60 seconds. And then Dynatrace recognized, okay, I got a span here which took more than 60 seconds. In that example, 650 seconds or 658 seconds and uh, sent me a notification to Teams, hey, please check uh, the logs of that job, maybe something is not working. And I think that's pretty cool. So um, we get notified if something starts to change in our pipelines. And now, what else would be awesome if we would be able to see um, where this particular commit or this particular change already got deployed to? And now if we think about that um, commit, which increased the build time for the front end that much, we could also filter um, for commits. So same like we can do for projects, we can do for commits. And um, it doesn't end here. So we can also add more variables we are interested in to that dashboard and could filter for that. For example, environment variables, or I don't know, anything we are interested in. And um, in that case, it seems like we're unlucky because that change with that increased build time already got deployed to production at 4.30 p.m. on that day. So, yeah, that's not ideal. Um, the reason why all of that is so powerful and, and why we can use the data and why we can filter through that are the attributes which we add to our pipeline traces and spans. So you can see here, I, I hope it's big enough, but um, we have a lot of different attributes there. And these are not all, so that's just a small portion of it. And they are enriching our traces and spans with more data, which we then can use to filter for certain things. And um, if you look closely, you will also see that we are already integrating the CICD semantic conventions, which got released in 127, and I think they are now in 128. So um, that's also pretty cool to see them in action here. Now, one more thing I, I have here to show is um, that we can even use the data, what we get from, from our pipeline instrumentation and from um, GitLab and combine it with additional things. So you can see, for example, here in that dashboard, we are using SDLC events. So the way it works is um, you can send requests to Dynatrace about certain events which are happening in your pipeline. And, um, we are, for example, extracting the base image, which are used in different uh, Docker files in our pipeline. And it's super hard to get the base image of already created images afterwards. So we send this information to Dynatrace, and then we have the possibility to correlate that with our data we get from, from our pipelines. 
And the same you can see here on the, on the bottom right corner, where I mentioned we are doing the helm chart validations. So we're doing the same there. We're sending those events to Dynatrace, and then we're combining that in the dashboard to get a nice holistic view into our software delivery lifecycle. Now, that brings me to, to uh, the last slide of mine, where I just wanted to, to give a, a short conclusion of what I think, what my key takeaway of that was. And um, I think the auto collector is really great, or in general, open telemetry is really great, because we, we saw the problem with missing insights into our pipeline. And um, yeah, with auto, we can just create our custom receiver, or maybe we can even use an existing receiver and get insight into that. So big shout out to the auto team and the maintainers for yeah, maintaining that great project. With that, I'm at the end of my slides and examples. I hope you enjoyed it so far. And Andy, what's next? Yeah, some, some, first of all, some recap, because I think this is something that I'm excited about, open telemetry. Open telemetry, or let's say distributed tracing, initially started to trace transactions in your business critical apps. But the pipeline is the most business critical app for your developers. And it's great to see that we can use open telemetry to trace critical activities end to end now. So I think that ecosystem now is growing, but I think what's also important is that all of you in the room here think about what else, what processes do you have, end-to-end -end processes do you have that you can also then monitor through open telemetry and then visualize with the tools that are already out there, right? Because visualization storage, that's also done. There's so many tools out there, both open source and commercial, but think about what else we can do with open telemetry. You have shown, even though you are I think as Walt said, told me you're not a hardcore developer, right? But you were able to build an open telemetry collector receiver. So you don't need to be a rocket scientist to do this. There's also great material out there. Uh, yeah, what's next? Uh, I think you can see this on the slides, the open telemetry. I think we, actually last week when we kind of promoted our talk on LinkedIn, we all of a sudden got a lot of uh, uh, good uh, response. Uh, there's also already a GitHub um, issue on the Open Telemetry Collector for bringing something like this uh, to, the, to the Open Telemetry Collector by default. Uh, the reason why this is uh, because there's already a GitHub receiver that does something similar. So consuming GitHub webhooks and then converting it into spans. What you're doing, same thing. You're receiving GitLab webhooks, converting it into spans. If you have any other CI CD tool that you're using, I assume they may have some type of webhook where they can send notifications. Follow Nicolas' paths, connect with the community. Uh, we're also reaching out to them to make sure that what you've built uh, right now will eventually make it to the upstream and then everybody can benefit from it. But yeah. obviously you already have the GitHub uh, repositories out there. Yeah. 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 And then maybe the last slide, um, before we go into questions, right? there's a lot of uh, QR codes that we have already posted earlier. The slides are also on, on the, um, the SCAD website uh, for this session. These are the two QR codes for our LinkedIn profiles, so you can also follow us, ask us questions. Um, and in terms of questions, we have about 10 minutes left. And one of the things that I also want to highlight here and also say thank you, we just recently published a book with two other CNCF ambassadors on uh, platform engineering for architects. Uh, a lot of the concepts that you just showed today about making your platform and especially the component around CI, CD and the software delivery lifecycle observable. We also cover this here in a book in a, with a very cloud native lens on it. And so I encourage you if you have questions for the first three people that have questions, I'm happy to give away some books because now we have about 10 minutes. Uh, and yeah, thank you. So just move to the microphones, there's two microphones, and see when you give, when you tell people that something is uh, for free, then people start asking. Awesome. <laughs> um, curious on your implementation, we're running an open telemetry collector for application traces. Um, are you running a new collector just for pipeline traces then, or do you combine that, and do you have any sampling that you're doing today on any of those pipelines? Yes, so here for that example, I'm running an auto collector with that, all, with that custom GitLab receiver separately, and then I have another auto collector which is doing all that application work, what you mentioned. And is the sampling rate currently on your pipelines like 100% or are you collecting yeah. all of that yeah. data? 100%. Okay. Cool, thank you. How do you position this solution relative to something like Apache DevLake? Sorry, can you say that, that again? 
Can, can you repeat the question? Yeah. How, how do you position this solution uh, compared to Apache DevLake, if you're familiar with that project? Do, do, do you know I'm not familiar with the, the DevLake project. Me um, neither. Is that basically you can just send, you would send your webhooks from your Git X or GitLab or GitHub to DevLake and then just analyze it from there, is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, it's, it, it, it aggregates a lot of data and stuff from different sources yeah. uh, via webhooks and other solutions yeah. and stuff to present analytics on your Dora metrics and, and other uh, CICD um, metrics and stuff. So that's I, I what think, I was kind of I think the nice thing about this is, and maybe we can go back to one of the slides where you saw the trace with the nightmare. Um, when you have a complex pipeline with multiple steps, his implementation is taking the individual webhooks from that pipeline and is creating an hotel span for every step and then it connects it all together because we know this comes from a particular pipeline. And I think you also mentioned you have, you have pipelines that call other pipelines. Yeah. So you can actually pass on that trace context also to sub-pipelines. And this is where then the beauty of open telemetry comes in. Now you're using Dynatrace to analyze it, but you can use then any other observability tool because open telemetry is a standard. And so you have many analytics options. If Apache, this uh, DevLake can also do this, great, but we wanted to latch on to the open telemetry standard and uh, because we have many opportunities to also then connect it with the application traces. Because one of the things we discussed, if you have an application that you trace and it, it starts with failures and with problems, you can then also find that trace that actually built and deployed that version. If you manage to get that trace study from that pipeline, let's say on the deployment, and then when you're capturing the application trace, you can enrich that with your deployment trace study, and then you can link it to the pipeline. And then you can really see end to end from the first git to make, commit until a production problem. How did this thing actually ended up here? Cool, thank you. Yeah, uh, kind of building off that last comment and your answers there, have you um, tried this all the way through like your GitOps processes and Argo CD and that kind of deployment uh, uh, metrics, kind of those spans, bringing it all together? So I think it's, it's hard to understand yeah, can here. Can you yeah. step a little closer? Yeah, to them? Uh, have you, uh, kind of building off the last comment, have you uh, tried stitching this all together with kind of your GitOps processes and Argo CD deployments? So what, what we, I can tell you from a Captain perspective, so that kind of triggered the whole thing uh, with the Captain Open Source project. With Captain, we create a trace uh, in, uh, from the Kubernetes scheduler, basically, perspective. And we allow you to add a, um, a trace ID on your deployment. And that trace ID could come from your GitHub action that is building that container or deploying it. So yes, you can stitch this all together. The only thing you need is you need to have some kind of unique identifier or you need to have a way wherever you start your trace, to pass this trace context to the next tool that is also enabled to create an open telemetry span or trace. So yeah, we can also talk more offline about this, but yes, we have, that's, that's the beauty of open telemetry because you can link multiple traces together. The only challenge is how to get the trace study from tool to tool. Yeah. And for the people that don't have books, we still have a couple of more books at the Dynatrace booth in case you're also interested in it. Uh, I think it's you next. Uh, thanks for the call. Um, from my understanding, uh, I am a bit new about uh, um, OpenTelemetry, but you can uh, uh, swap Dynatrace with another uh, UI. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks uh, for the talk as well. Um, it's uh, nice to see some GitLab uh, pipeline stuff because uh, everybody here is using Argo CD and all that. Um, so how do you pass uh, authentication to uh, the, I guess, whatever collector uh, you're using to collect the hotel traces? How do you define the authentication from your GitLab to the OpenTelemetry collector? So, so there is no authentication right now because it's like internally, so we don't need to authenticate there. But okay. um, maybe that's something we can add in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Anything else? Any other questions? Good, then, again, awesome for your first presentation. Yeah. Thank you. And, I'm, and again, it's my role as an ambassador. If you have, if you're doing things like this, 
this is a perfect stage for you to present your own stories. Reach out to your local CNCF ambassador, to your local community. We are happy to always help you to present at a KubeCon or at a KCD event or at the local meetup. Because you know, your ideas will inspire many, many other new ideas. Thanks. <laughs>